I am Gene Alexander. I worked at RCA in Camden from 1950, let's see, the end of 1954 until I retired at the end of 1987. And uh, my last year or two were out in a suburban location in Moorestown, but for the lion's share of it, I was in Camden. Um, what were some of the first projects and major projects that you worked on? Um, <clears throat> when I came into uh, RCA from the old Philco Corporation in Philadelphia, uh, where I had worked on naval uh, airborne radar development, uh, I fit right in because I joined a project that was doing some airborne radar for the Navy. Uh, it was a kind of a small-scale project, uh, but it was a... Uh, a learning experience for most of the people in the group that were working there. Uh, and during that time, we worked up a proposal to the Canadian government, who were about to build what has since become a legendary aircraft uh, called the, uh, the Arrow. Movies have been made about the development of that aircraft. And uh, we wrote a proposal to do the electronics for it, and were they successful? bitter uh, to do that project, partly because we happen to have an affiliated activity in Montreal, uh, RCA Canada Limited, and, um, and that got us going in big time in the uh, airborne fire control radar business, which is the kind of system you need if you're going to be able to fly in a supersonic jet and shoot down a supersonic bomber with having computed where the collision of the weapon with the, with the enemy will take place many minutes before it actually happens and, and miles away from where you are when it does happen. Uh, the technology was moving rapidly at that time. Uh, the Canadians proposed to build an airplane bigger and faster than anything that had ever been built before for military. And uh, it was a pretty thrilling assignment, particularly for me because um, I had written part of the proposal, and when we got the award, uh, I was uh, immediately appointed to do the intercorporate and and customer liaison. So I was running all over the uh, the border to uh, Toronto and Montreal and Ottawa and Minneapolis, where we had a co-contractor in Honeywell, uh, and this was my first really big time project. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the political picture changed as well as the technological picture, and although the Canadians had successfully built prototypes of that aircraft and flown it at Mach 2 before anybody else in the world had done that uh, with a military aircraft, uh, the program got to be canceled, and, uh, and we were all suddenly unemployed. <laughs> but. Uh, Fortunately, at that time, uh, the U.S. government uh, decided that they were dependent too heavily on Howard Hughes, uh, Hughes Aircraft Company, which was developing fire control radar and uh, successfully equipping the aircraft for the, uh, uh, for the Korean War at that time. Uh, the concern was that Howard Hughes, who ran the company himself, was such a kook that the national defense of the United States should not be dependent on him. And so uh, our General Sarnoff, he was a general by honorary de degree, uh, was called into Washington and awarded for the convenience of the government in quote marks. That means no, no competitive bidding. Take as much money as you need and create a second source for these radar systems uh, to the Howard Hughes organization. And so we still were in the big time after all. And uh, that total experience resulted in the hiring of hundreds of engineers and technicians and draftsmen and so forth. Uh, and uh, contributed heavily to the development of these suburbs, uh, which were all built uh, up in the 
oh, I guess it's the late 50s, early 60s and 70s. Uh, this is the time that Cherry Hill evolved from from an orchard, a cherry orchard on a hill. <laughs> uh, and uh, and embraced the racetrack that had newly been built. Uh, uh, became a big entertainment center with the Latin Casino and and uh, we had um, a lot of elegant restaurants and the Cherry Hill Inn and so forth that um, kind of created an identity for this little suburb that was just springing up between two time-honored colonial towns of Haddonfield and Moorestown. And uh, RCA was very much a part of, of that. The number of developments that uh, grew up around in, the, in this area was at least a dozen. Uh, literally thousands of houses built during that time. And this was also coincided in, in 1969 and 1971. There were race riots in Camden that succeeded in uh, pretty much demolishing the uh, retail businesses and drove a lot of merchants out of Camden. Uh, into Cherry Hill and Pensauken, and uh, so that boosted the suburban development even further. And that's kind of how the picture evolved uh, socially at that time. So when you started out at RCA, did you have any mentors who kind of showed you the ropes? Turned out that I had to be a mentor when I got here because I had had a few years of uh, background in uh, in the uh, design of uh, uh, specific radar, specifically radar display systems. And uh, my first assignment was as the lead engineer in a group of guys who didn't have the first idea how to do what they were trying to do. Uh, and so uh, it kind of was, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I picked up some mentors along the way. Irving Brown was one that sticks in my mind. He's long departed. He lived here in Cherry Valley, uh, but he was uh, he was a, a good mentor. Uh, a few others as, uh, as time went by, but uh, I had a career that was constantly changing. I don't know, maybe I had a restless attitude or something, but uh, I did such a wide range of things, ranging from those display systems for the radars uh, to uh, some small projects that we did in the field of medical electronics uh, in a kind of a joint venture with the Hoffman LaRoche Pharmaceutical Company. Uh, they were looking to get into building electronic equipment to go with their drugs. And uh, they gave us a few assignments to develop a few units. It was fascinating to do something completely different. Uh, and ultimately, my final project program in the, uh, before I retired was uh, developing a system for the uh, Postal Service. Uh, so, uh, for me, it was constant variety and, and a, a really enjoyable career. And of course, I skipped over one major highlight, which was the uh, space program, uh, working on equipment for the Apollo moon launch. And uh, it was a it was a pleasure to go to work. <laughs> Never seemed to be a, a, an unpleasant job. My next question was, what was it like to work for RCA kind of as an overall experience? Fun. <laughs> you bring me to think, you know, before, when I was still, a, still in high school, uh, I, some of the kids that I was friendly with, uh, there was one young lady who was, uh, she was at the time a, a college student, but the sister of some of the guys and girls that I was familiar with. And she had a summer job at RCA. Back in the days when Camden was where they did the radio, the, the phonograph business. 
And her job was to write the blurb, what they called the blurbs, the page that went inside a 12-inch record album uh, that described the artist and the music and so forth and so on. And uh, she wrote a little verse which went something like, uh, RCA, RCA, that's the place to work and play. RCA, RCA, that's the place to go and say, RCA, RCA. I thought that was kind of cute. It stuck in my head. <laughs> but I think that's maybe a, the right answer to your question. Do you have any stories about maybe what happened outside of work or just kind of stories that you remember like that? No. Oh, just the everyday sort of thing, you know, the fact that uh, we uh, were in a new community, we had a school right down the end of the block and a swimming pool that was available for the community, and uh, the fact that uh, things were happening all over the township at that time. It was a, it was a great experience. So how did RCA kind of affect your life outside of work? Well, it uh, provided much needed income, and uh, I don't know, it was my job. <laughs> a fortunate one because, it, as, I'm, as I said, uh, I enjoyed that job. What do you think would be the best thing about working for RCA? What would be the best thing? I think the total experience. Uh, as I was discussing with Jim before, of having the opportunity to participate in a lot of nationally significant, perhaps even globally significant, uh, developments. Uh, it was a place where, you know, there was always something good that was going on that, that you wanted to be a part of. What would you say the worst thing was about RCA? The worst thing about RCA? Well, for the most part, the facility was kind of shabby, uh, whereas uh, some people worked in lovely palatial brand new facilities with marvelous new labs. We were working in this old building with checkerboard linoleum floors and plywood uh, benches, workbenches. And, uh, but we didn't mind it, you know, because... And maybe it was deliberately that way, so that our minds were, were, uh, were on our work. So, what would you say that the impact of RCA has had on South Jersey, both for you and kind of overall? Well, the impact on me was that uh, I, for the most productive years of my life experience, I guess I had the opportunity to be doing what I like to do. And uh, it provided the wherewithal for me to live the way I like to live and uh, raise my kids the way I felt they should be raised. And uh, you can interview them later if you want to find out of how successful I may or may not have been. <laughs> Do you think that RCA was one of America's most important companies, and how do you think that changed? Well, as I said earlier, uh, it was a, a, a unique kind of company in that uh, the work we did there was always at the cutting edge of technology and provided many, many breakthroughs, everything from, you know, when you think television, that essentially began with RCA. Uh, our work in the space program, uh, our vital contributions to all of the wars that were going on in terms of communications equipment that was built, encryption equipment, things of that nature, uh, facilities for the Navy. I mean, I've been speaking only for the work that was done in Camden. I haven't mentioned the things that were going on simultaneously at Moorestown, which uh, came to be the provider of the uh, so-called shield of the fleet, the Aegis system, which is the protection, protecting radar that goes on every ship that's been built in the 
in the last 20, 30 years, I guess. Uh, and of course, all of this supplanted the engineers in the Home Instruments Division who got <laughs> run out of town by us expanding, I guess, but they wound up in, Minia in Indianapolis uh, where their factory was located. Uh, these were the guys that did the television design. And uh, prior to, uh, to our expansion in the military equipment field, uh, they were the, the RCA people. So you mentioned how, I mean, how long you were in Camden. How do you think RCA affected both Camden and South Jersey overall? My mind is, is wandering here because I'm thinking, this, you know, these... Uh, uh, examination questions that are given in which they will ask the same question differently a little later than they asked at the beginning to make sure you're being honest in your answers. Is that the question you just asked me? It might have been. <laughs> <laughs> uh, say it again. <laughs> just if you have any thoughts about how RCA impacted South Jersey overall. <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, to be serious for a moment, uh, yeah, I think RCA happened to be uh, a contributor at a critical time in the development of certainly of Cherry Hill Township, which was nothing before this very same period of time. Uh, and uh, you know, the mere presence of us as as a as a large group of uh, Residents with uh, what would be called, I guess, upper middle class income, and uh, or at least middle class income, uh, so that uh, just you know, in terms of dollars and cents, we we had an impact. So. When you worked at RCA, would you maybe describe it as a family, or was it just a job? How would you kind of describe what working at RCA was like? Well, the term RCA family uh, actually existed. Um, our so-called lunch club, which was the name given to the cafeteria and the service restaurant that was built in as part of it, also had a take-home shop, kind of like the old Horn and Hard Arts, Less Work for Mother. But the RCA family uh, was served that way. The women that were working could take home pre-cooked meals. Uh, the other RCA family terminology was from the family store, which was where you could buy television sets and radios and tape recorders and so forth uh, at a discount. You can always match those discounts almost anywhere for the simple reason that uh, RCA was bound not to undersell their own retail outlet, not their own, but the retail outlets that you did business with. So they never really offered discounts better than you could get in the discount stores. However, they did do sometimes special promotions that were unusual. For example, the so-called anniversary model color television set, which was the first one that was production that uh, was that was um, suitable for production the earlier ones were kind of they, they drifted and the colors changed and there were all kinds of problems with de being developing the developmentally worked out but when they finally got one they thought could sell and be reliable uh, the first place they launched it was uh, at an, an attractive price for this one special model uh, for all the employees to be paid off at some minuscule amount out of your paycheck for a couple of years or something like that. And so we had one of the first color television sets that, that was uh, available. But that was uh, one of the nice features of the RCA family store. Um, do you have any other stories or... You know, any other thoughts about what it was like working for RCA, especially because you were in so many different projects? I hate to interrupt real quick, so you're doing a phenomenal job. 
but I'm picking up the audio of your hands. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, all of the above. <laughs> I guess, do you have any final thoughts to sum up whether how you worked or what you found here over the years? Final thought. It was a lot of fun, as I have said, and I'd like to get the chance to do it all again. <laughs> you mentioned Apollo. Did you work on yeah. the Apollo program? Yeah. What did you work on? Uh, I worked on the on a gadget that was the um, the uh, range backup unit. Uh, when the Apollo, let's, let, me, let me recall the nomenclatures here. You had the lunar excursion module. That was the LEM, as it was called. That was the thing that landed on the moon, and it got there attached to the command module which was the larger, more powerful device. Um, when it was time to go home, uh, it was a very critical thing to be able to get the limb back into its mounting bracket on the, on the command module for the orbital trip back down to Earth. Uh, the big risk was that They'd crash together instead of coming together gently and latching the way they should. Uh, the primary means of accurately gauging the distance as the two were coming together uh, was by a radar, a specialized radar. That, that uh, But since everything, there was not a chance of leaving anybody behind on the moon. Uh, everything was backed up. So there had to be a second ranging unit in case the radar failed. And that second ra ra uh, ranging unit was derived from the fact that the radio transmissions from the command module, the, the, the words being spoken and sent out by radio uh, to the LEM, uh, and, the, and, the, and their returns, and uh, were utilized so that uh, periodically message, parts of the message would go out and come back immediately, being, being retransmitted by the equipment automatically. And the phase delay, that is the, well, technical term, it's, actually it, it, it amounts to that tiny bit of time delay that it takes for the message to go down and come back. That can be calibrated and give you the distance knowing the speed of light, which is how, how electronic information travels. So we built a little gadget about the size of a small shoebox, I think. And if you go to the, um, to the Smithsonian, uh, you will find it under the seat of the, uh, of the uh, guy in the command module that was operating. It was built in there, and happily it never got to be used. But that, that, that's the nature of that business. You build stuff and you do make it the very best you can. Uh, and in some cases, it's just a case. Did you have a favorite project that you worked on? Well, my favorite project really was my swan song, uh, more or less. Uh, that was the uh, system called ECOM, Electronic Computer Originated Mail. The Postmaster General uh, had come to believe that if the Postal Service could offer a means of communicating uh, the billing information that people like, well, the example at the time was Shell Oil and the credit cards back in, this was in the late 1970s, uh, digital communications for business use was just really beginning to evolve. Uh, electronic mail, as we know it, where people just, you know, type something in and it automatically gets magically sent to wherever and, and they get an answer back the same way. But at that time, uh, 
that kind of electronic mail was, uh, was, you know, really just a twinkle in people's eye. And the Postal Service thought, well, gee, if we are able to get people's electronic mail and and transmit it from one post office to another and then print it out and have the letter carrier bring it to them like their bill for the, for their credit card purchases of uh, gasoline, which was a big thing in those, in those days, uh, would be a good thing. And so uh, RCA was uh, awarded a contract to, in one year's time, design, build, install uh, equipment that would enable the Postal Service to send, to accept mail from users via telephone lines or being carried in on computer tapes or whatever, uh, sort it, and then transmit it to all the other cities that it had to go to after it had been sorted electronically in the computer. Uh, and then printed out at those destination cities, pre-sorted so that the letter carriers could just pick it up and drop it. Nice idea, but you know, nowadays that, that's, <laughs> that's ridiculous. But, but at the time, it was uh, something that they thought was worth doing. So they named 25 of the major post offices around the country and said, if we could do this job in one year, we could have $40 million, which was the amount that the contract, and um, the small group of us that had been doing some studies for the Postal Service in advance of that, uh, I wound up being asked to write the program plan for this, which, well, the whole job was pretty difficult, but the program plan was impossible, and uh, we had a so-called red team uh, evaluation of the proposal by the various managers of different sections that came in to look it over and tell us what they thought of our proposal. And they all said, it's a loser. <laughs> it's never going to succeed. Um, but, you know, the $40 million was there for the taking, so we took it and we went with it. And doggone if we didn't actually do it. <laughs> we, got, we, we got computers into 25. Uh, and in those days, we're not talking desktop computers. We're talking four racks of equipment and several great big disk drives that were the size of washing machines. And, uh, and uh, we had to train like 250 postal workers. In order to do that, we built a schoolhouse in the parking lot at RCA. We, we, had, the, we had a, a local contractor, well, there was somebody out of Maryland actually, um, put together a couple of modules and create a little schoolhouse building, a uh, little wooden building, and it was quite comfortable actually, fully furnished. And we got the serv RCA service company, uh, who were in the business of training military technicians to maintain the radars that RCA sold. And we had them develop a course to teach these people how to do all this mail handling. <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, then we had to do the software, and then we had to do we had to create a billing center for them, which was set up in uh, Wilkesboro, PA. Uh, and we had to get it all into operation and test it out. And, and the postal po the postmaster general made good his threat and announced that at the time he awarded the contract that we were to deliver this in one year's time, and he was going to be there. And, we did it. It worked. It, of course, was uh, something that technology quickly surpassed, so it, it disappeared after two years of operation. But it was my most difficult job, the most difficult challenge that I faced, and just, I guess, because it was successful, I take the, the most pride in it. Anything else you want to say? <laughs> It's just what I said before, I guess. If you find out how I can get a chance to do it all over again for another 40 years, I'll do it. 